Um, today I'm going to talk about the relationship to taxation, governance, and development. And for many years, taxation was considered a quite boring topic. It was mostly undertaken by tax administration experts, neoclassical economists, who thought of issues like how can we collect tax most efficiently and optimally, and this was very important, but it wasn't linked to a much broader and deeper history in political theory, in political economy, that taxation is actually central to the whole idea of a state and to governance. Edmund Burke, the, Br the English philosopher a long time ago said, taxation is the state. If you don't have a tax base, a state can't deliver any goods or services. It can't provide a um, social order. It can't provide anything that most citizens want of a country. So I'm going to talk about why tax is so central. I also think tax is central because a lot of the discussions of governance, uh, issues of transparency, um, accountability, and so on and so forth, have been discussed without discussing or ignoring where the money for these things are going to come from. Because providing social order, protection, a rule of law, a judicial system, public services, infrastructure costs a lot of money. And when you think about that, taxation becomes central to that process. And it's especially central, as we'll see, because the only route out of reducing aid dependency over time is for a country to collect its own taxation. So let's look at some of the um, reasons why tax and tax reform are so central to state building and to governance generally. First of all, it, it, as I mentioned at the beginning, it enables the funding for social programs, for public investments, and public goods to promote economic growth and development. And so any discussion of governance has to have a discussion of where is the material basis going to come from to provide the financing for these things. An even older tradition is that taxation in some respects is the main nexus that links states and citizens. Citizens pay taxation to a state in return for the expectation of the delivery of social goods and services. And because of that, um, taxation is constitutive of state building because it provides the financial means for the state to deliver public goods, but it's also constitutive of civil society organizations and their construction. So interest groups organize to both resist, to advocate, or to change tax policy. And when you think through history, for example, the American Revolution was based on the mantra of no taxation without representation, yes? The Boston Tea Party was a rebellion against the British taxing tea imports to the colonies. I'm going to come back to this issue of why less developed countries have a particular challenge when it comes to taxation. So tax is constitutive of the state because it provides the financing for goods and services, and it's also constitutive of civil society groups, labor unions, business associations, and so on and so forth. Thirdly, taxation, particularly in the form of land and property taxes, which historically were the most important taxes in the now advanced countries, the United States, Japan, northern European countries, 150 years ago, property taxes was the single most important tax, not trade taxes, which is the current idea today that when you're a poor country, the easiest thing to collect is trade taxes. Land taxes were quite important historically because they provided a territorial reach of the state. The state penetrated all parts of its territory and had a presence, and that helped build its bureaucratic capacity to intervene in other sectors of the economy. And finally, fiscal capacities are needed to rebuild, to build a legitimate state. Elections on their own don't do that. If you win an election in a country that collects 5% of GDP in tax, let's say $50 a person, which is something that's not that far from what, say, the DRC collects, you win an election to do what? Right? One has to think about the fact that legitimacy comes from delivering 
jobs, growth, and services, and that takes money to do so. So for these reasons, actually tax is one of the best lenses for understanding governance, for understanding the political economy of power structures in a country, who pays and for what reasons do they pay the state. The World Bank in the 1997 um, development report, which is in some sense was the first systematic statement of what the good governance agenda is, had one interesting argument in, in, that, in that report, and that was that governments should not try to intervene in areas of the economy or the society where they don't have the capacity to do so successfully. And a lot of the economic liberalization in the last 20 to 30 years has been based on the fact that, uh, based on the argument that most governments have failed to deliver economic growth and development because they were trying things that were too ambitious. And so things like industrial policy, marketing boards in agriculture were all dismantled because it was argued that it tended to generate lots of rent seeking and corruption and dysfunctional governments because they didn't have the capacity and skill to carry these things out. And so economic liberalization was considered a second best way to move forward. Now interestingly, in this report, taxation is not considered one of the five fundamental roles of a state. You see things like the rule of law, macro stability, protecting the poor, social environment. But the one thing that constitutes the state financially is not considered, a, which I think is actually a remarkable um, neglect. Joseph Schimpetto argued a long, long time ago that the fiscal history of a people is above all an essential part of its general history. And we'll come to see why that is in different aspects. Now, keeping this, this general context in mind, it's important to consider what some of the challenges of increasing tax collection is for poor countries. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the improvement of taxation is one of the central challenges and it's become more dominant in the donor community, in the international financial community, and so on. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa faces a particular challenge because the financing of infrastructure is probably the single biggest obstacle to its long-run growth, particularly infrastructure in agriculture. And because Sub-Saharan Africa is a quite expensive region to irrigate, because its water table is um, expensive to bring to the surface, domestic resource mobilization, much beyond the amount of international aid, is a central challenge. However, in the last 25 years, Sub-Saharan African countries have increased their tax take as a percentage of national income from about 15% on average, and there's lots of variations which we'll go into, about 15% of GDP to about 18%. However, almost all of that increase has been due to the taxation of natural resources. And we'll come to see also that Sub-Saharan African countries don't tax nearly as much as they could from a lot of the minerals, fuels, and agriculture that they have. So what has happened in the last 25 years is that economic liberalization has reduced trade taxes because tariffs have been reduced, and it's mostly been replaced by VAT. But any net increase in the last 25 years has, all, has been due to the commodity booms in fuels and minerals in the region. So the, non, the taxation in the last 25 years in sub-Saharan Africa, on average, that comes from non-fuel and non-mineral royalties has increased only 1%. And that is one of the Achilles heels of its growth process in the last quarter century. And without an increase in not only the tax take, but the number of people that are, that, that are the number of tax payers that are actually registered, the social contract in, in, in a country becomes quite limited. Because one needs to think of tax as kind of a fiscal social contract. Citizens pay money to a state and they expect goods and services in return. It's a mutual obligation. And that process of increasing the fiscal social prospect has been virtually, has had virtually no progress in sub-Saharan Africa in the last 25 years. 
outside of the commodity boom. Just some basic theory for a second. Why do poor countries have such a hard time collecting tax? I showed you the statistics on you know, the average sub-Saharan African country collects between 15 and 18 percent. We'll come to the variations in the region. The typical OECD country collects, in, and it varies a substantial amount, between 35 and 50 percent of GDP. And of course, that's a percentage of a much higher GDP per capita. We'll come to that in a moment. But the traditional economic analysis of why tax collection is so low in a poor country has to do with some structural factors. One, there's a very large scale of subsistence agriculture, which by definition is not taxable because subsistence means you have nothing left over to tax. Secondly, there's a quite large informal sector or informal activities even within formal sector firms that by definition are out of the purview of the tax base. There are many small establishments that don't use a, a modern accounting standards or try to evade tax purposefully. There's a very small share of salaried wage income in total national income that's registered. That is the formal labor force that, has that, 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 that's, that are registered taxpayers tends to be quite small the poorer a country is. And the total share of consumer spending made in large modern establishments tends to be small. So for all these reasons, economic structural reasons, the tax take tends to be much lower. And as an economy advances economically, these things become less and less important. Right? As you become a more wealthy country, your subsistence agriculture declines, your informal sector declines, and the formal sector grows and the tax base increases. So one of the reasons why economic growth is so central to governance is that the possibility of increasing the tax base enhances. Right? You can't increase the tax base without economic growth. Right? And there's not, that's, not, that's not an issue that's subject to debate. Right? I'm a, almost any economist, political economist, from whatever political persuasion would argue, you can't increase, increase the tax base without growth. And because, the ta because tax is the fiscal social contract between state and citizens, it's very difficult to have a material basis for good governance without economic growth. And this is one of the reasons historically that you see, see good governance or effective governance occur after long periods of economic growth and not before. Some other challenges that face low-income countries in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular are things like there's a very high dependence on trade taxes in poor countries in contemporary times, and this is different from the historical record of OECD countries. There's a high level of non-tax revenue, especially from mineral royalties. One of the big literatures in recent times has been this idea of the resource curse. And the resource curse is based on the idea that some countries can actually develop lots of government revenue, not from taxing domestic citizens, but from earning royalties from oil, natural gas, copper, and so on, where they don't have to bargain with domestic citizens. And this resource curse argues that when that happens, you can, that can generate very predatory governments and arbitrary governments that don't depend on bargaining with domestic interest groups to raise revenues because they can raise it just by taxing multinationals, oil companies, natural gas companies, and so on. Thirdly, there's a very narrow base of taxpayers in poor countries. And hence, there's a very important role that the large taxpayer office in a revenue authority plays. So in a country like Tanzania, Uganda, something like 2,000 people and establishments pay almost 75 to 80 percent of the tax base. This has a very important implication for the fiscal social contract and therefore governance. Now while, the, while taxation affects everyone because people that consume, including poor people, pay VAT indirectly, the actual contribution to the tax base never rarely goes beyond two or three thousand people or organizations. And there's a lot of evasion amongst those upper income groups as well. So there's a problem of just the number of taxpayers. Thirdly, there's a dominance. There, there tends to be a concentration of tax in the capital city or the main economic city in terms of the sort of spatial distribution of tax. There's very few localities that contribute the majority of the tax of a country. 
There tends to be higher rates of tax evasion. And in countries that experience um, political violence and civil war, there's an also important phenomenon of non-state rivals to tax collection. So you can think of warlords in Afghanistan or the DRC. It's not so much the tax level that matters to a state's resilience and stability, but are there competing non-state actors collecting revenue? That can be a very destabilizing thing for governance and political stability generally. But certainly one of the biggest challenges in recent times to tax collection in sub-Saharan Africa has been trying to replace trade, lost trade taxes as a result of the reduction in tariffs. Because right? when you reduce tariffs, you reduce trade revenue unless trade grows so much to compensate for that reduction and it really does. IMF studies have shown that most countries that liberalize trade quite quickly don't make back those lost tra trade revenues with VAT or income tax. And so compensating for that loss is a very central challenge in a region like Sub-Saharan Africa. Some countries have done better than others. And before I move on to some political economy challenges, um, I think it's important to keep in mind a couple of, uh, imp a couple of aspects about taxation. One I mentioned earlier, there's actually very few people, individuals and corporations that contribute to most of the tax base. But also I want you to keep in mind what the tax collection looks like in a typical low-income country compared to an OECD country. This is important because the governance agenda is based partially on the idea that models of governance or benchmarks of excellence occur or in rich countries. Right? So Norway, the United States, Japan, or some mixture represent the state of the art of governance. And a lot of the good governance agenda is about arguing that things like transparency, accountability, and so on and so forth, which are dominant features of rich countries, are something that poor countries need to replicate very quickly if their economic development is to revive and sustain itself. I'm going to ask the group a question. What do you think the tax collection per person is in the United States or the United Kingdom today? Just give a guess. Just think about what its GDP per capita is. And remember that I said between 35 and 50 percent of taxes collected in an OECD country. So the Nordic countries collect the highest levels at around 50 percent of GDP because they have very big welfare states. The United States collects around 35 percent. So what do you think the average tax collection per person is in the United States or Great Britain? Ballpark figure. It's about $25,000 a person. Right? The United States' GDP per capita is close to $50,000, and it collects something like, depending on the state, 35 to 40 percent of tax collection. So let's say $20,000, just for the sake of probably about $20,000. What do you think the tax collection per capita is in a country like Tanzania, or Cape Verde, or Mozambique, or Senegal? $2,000 a person? $1,000? $500? dollars getting warmer. In sub-Saharan Africa, if you take out South Africa, which, by the way, is one of the most successful tax collecting authorities in the world, not even for a it's between, at the low end, $50 a person to about 400 in a country like Zambia, of the taking Botswana and sub uh, South Africa out, which are high-income countries, or upper-middle-income countries. When one begins to think about whether you, what type of governance you expect in a country that collects between $50 and $400 a person versus a country that collects between $20,000 and in the case of Sweden, $30,000 a person. When you begin to think about that for one or two minutes or even one or two seconds, you might think that the nature of governance is likely to be much different at different stages of development. 
And that's the main idea that I want you to go away with today when one thinks about what we should expect of governance and what should indexes of governance actually expect countries to do, to, to reflect. I will argue at the end of this that I think taxation, because it has a very deep theory in history in its relationship to governance, is probably the single biggest and most important indicator of governance there is. I'm not going to go through this in detail because it's quite complicated, but there are certainly lots of arguments in the political science literature about why collecting tax can be quite difficult in low-income countries, apart from the economic structural ones. One of them is this argument of Douglas North, an economic historian, who's written about, more recently, about what is the, what is the nature of economic policy, and what is the nature of balances of power and of political bargain that generates order, that is, that prevents civil, civil war through history? And one of his arguments is that one of the ways that countries have solved this Hobbesian problem of everyone trying to kill each other is to give very powerful elites around a country lots of economic privileges, what, what one is called economic rents, that is, super profits, that is, access to valuable land, access to valuable foreign exchange, a managerial job in a state-owned enterprise. What these economic rents or privileges mean is that, and, wh wh and why are they there? They're there for, to prevent or provide an incentive for elites not to take a faction of the military and undertake a coup. And so North argues through history that these bargains, these elite bargains as he calls them, tend to provide order. They're not very fair, right? Because it's, giving a, it's creating a certain oligarchy that's quite privileged. And one just needs to walk down any capital city in a poor country, or even a middle-income country like Brazil, to see the vast differences in wealth between the top 10% and the bottom 50%. Yeah, um, I haven't actually made the argument. What I'm saying is that one of the ways in which governments have generated economic rents or super profits. Rents, I don't mean what you pay for your flat or apartment. Economic rent, rents in the sense of um, super profits or super income flows. One of the ways in which governments have deployed that rent is through the tolerance of tax evasion of very high income groups. The people with the biggest ability to pay actually pay very little tax in sub-Saharan Africa. Multinational corporations, as bad a deal as sub-Saharan African countries have gotten from a lot of deals lately, elites pay even less. And one of the ways in which, and so linking it to North's argument, one of the ways, and I'll go into how this has evolved, in which elite bargains have been stable is for a systematic tolerance of tax evasion amongst the rich. And this is without even an argument about tax havens or anything else. Secondly, there's this general argument that you know, African politics is characterized by neo-patrimonial and clientelist and corrupt relations that makes it difficult to develop a professional tax bureaucracy. Thirdly, there's the argument that the, that the countries that have a huge dependence on mineral rents and aid, also aid is another way, similar to oil, aid is government revenue that's not earned in the sense that a government doesn't have to bargain with citizens domestically to collect tax. It just comes from a donor. And so if a large proportion of revenue is coming in through minerals and aid, there might be a disincentive for leaders to collect tax. Might be. It's an empirical question. The evidence actually suggests that's not true. And finally, donor conditionalities. The IMF, when it undertakes structural adjustment programs, often insists on increasing the tax base to reduce the fiscal deficit. And when that's undone too quickly and too coercively, that can undermine the legitimacy of a state. So actually, becoming stable macroeconomically can have a negative governance effect if the government like Uganda has recently, in the last 10 years, undertaken quite military methods to collect tax. Finally, the other big challenge for Sub-Saharan Africa is that it is the region, this looks at capital flight as a share of private wealth in different regions. Now, there's a Capgemini and KPMG produce something called the World Wealth Report, 
which shows what, what tries to estimate what private asset owners in different regions and countries within them have abroad. This data is from 2000. The numbers would be the same if it was in 2010. Sub-Saharan Africa has something like, well, at the end of around 2000, 30% of all of its wealth is held abroad. The estimates are between 30 and 50. That's vastly higher than any other region. That is, not held in just tax haven, held in New York, held in Zurich, held in London, right? Not what we think of as traditional tax havens, because London and New York are the two biggest tax havens in the world. Because most people, most foreigners that are quite wealthy have the lightest tax burden in New York and London than any other place, including the Cayman Islands. So that's a huge amount of money that's not taxed, that's out of the purview of the tax collector. So I've gone through structural reasons that limit tax collection, some political economy ones, and this last structural one, that Sub-Saharan Africa is characterized by the highest level of private wealth held abroad. Yes? It's a possibility, it's a theoretical possibility. Actually, the evidence doesn't support this. Countries that have been aid dependent like Rwanda, Mozambique, and so on, the, uh, Ghana, Ethiopia, have actually increased their tax base with increasing aid dependency. It's a theory, it's part of what the resource curse or rentier state theory, that argues that when you get a lot of income that's, that comes from not bargaining with citizens, it can have a disincentive for, tax, for leaders to collect tax. That's a theory, but we'll, we'll come to it, and I'm going to argue it's actually not true. So I don't think donors are contributing to this problem. That's the evidence broadly seems to suggest that. Now, despite these structural, uh, there's, before, I, before I go into to this, this slide, I mean, I've gone through all of these potential constraints and obstacles, both from an economic and political perspective. But I do want to go back to that issue about the $30,000, the $20,000 versus the $400 per capita. Apart from the fact that the ramifications of what type of governance you're going to expect are going to be very different. I also think that one of the biggest challenges for low-income countries in terms of governance is that you have a demand for representation without taxation. Because 2,000 individuals and corporations contribute 80% of the tax base in a country like Uganda or Tanzania, or Ethiopia, what the good governance agenda, you have to remember the, the American Revolution was based on tax, no taxation without representation. What's demanded now rightly of people is that they want representation, but 90% of the people contribute almost nothing to taxation in a poor country because of these structural and political reasons. Not because they're evading tax or it's their fault or anything else, but this is an enormous challenge of how do you create a type of governance that's based on mutual obligations between state and citizen when most people actually don't contribute very much to the tax base of a low-income country. It's not necessarily a feature that's going to stop development. This was true of the rich countries 250 years ago. They managed to develop. It's not an inevitable obstacle, but it is a very big challenge that is not thought of when people talk about governance and indices and so on and so forth. Right. Remember, most people are not contributing anything to the tax that they expect a lot from the state, rightly so. Now, despite all of these challenges, there's actually a huge variation in the tax performance, collection performance in sub-Saharan Africa. Some countries seem to be navigating through these challenges better than others. The IMF, and this is on the further readings, has suggested that one of the ways that countries have overcome the challenge of the reduction in trade taxes as a result of economic liberalization has not just been relying on VAT to replace trade taxes, but those countries that have actually diversified their tax base across all types, corporate, personal, property tax, are the ones that do better in meeting that challenge of the reduction in trade taxes from an economic liberalization. This has a resonance for, for post-war countries, by the way, because the only type of tax, when you think about state building, the only type of tax a weak, country, a weak state can collect is usually trade taxes. And so if you're in a country like Afghanistan and advocating economic liberalization, 
that might be contradictory to the state building process because if you take away the one type of tax a weak state can collect, you might be undermining the whole project of consolidating or building a state in the first place. And then whatever else other type of reforms you suggest, whether they're economic or governance, really don't matter because you don't have a state. If you have Somalia, it doesn't really matter what you argue, right, if there's no tax collection. Because as Edmund Burke said, tax is the state. So one policy thing to think about is, is rapid economic liberalization undermining tax collection? As it turns out, Sub-Saharan Africa has met this challenge in differential ways. The countries that have done best have been those that haven't just relied on consumption tax, which has been the driver of tax in recent times, but have done so by having a diversified tax base. And this contradicts the conventional wisdom that VAT is the best type of tax. The countries that have done best, countries like Zambia, Ghana, Ethiopia, have done better than countries like Uganda and the DRC because they've diversified their tax base more. I'm going to go through certain issues now around um, taxation that's quite important. One of them is a big one in the literature, especially in the advocacy literature is that in the last 10 years, Sub-Saharan Africa has, and a lot of the world has experienced the commodity boom because of demand from China and India for raw materials. Most of Sub-Saharan Africa has missed the opportunity to appropriate economic rents and tax revenues from this boom. And it has, it's a complicated set of reasons why this is. I'll take the case of Zambia and copper. And ballpark figure, in the last 10 years, Zambia has received, let's, let's, little, let's take a historical perspective. Zambia was one of the richest countries in sub-Saharan Africa in the 1960s. Um, from the mid-1960s to 2000, it had the second worst performance of per capita growth in sub-Saharan Africa. By the way, it was also the same country that's one of the most stable polities in the world in terms of a lack of large-scale political violence. One, one thing to remember, all good things don't go together. Zambia is a, a model of political stability. It's a basket case in terms of economic performance in the last 40 years. Just to, it's something I'll come back later, that aggregate indices of governance are very misleading. Zambia performs very well in certain functions and appallingly in others. And that's true of South Africa, it's true of Brazil, it's true of any country you look at. And I would argue against the use of an aggregate index because it doesn't tell you anything really about a country. How do you give Zambia a score when it's avoided deaths? When all of its neighbors have had tens of millions of people dying around it, that's no mean feat. But yes, it ha yet it has the second worst performance in economic growth and its human development index. It's the only country in sub-Saharan Africa or one of two where the human development index has declined every decade in the last four decades. Yet it's a country that's quite peaceful. How do, how do you give that country a score? It's difficult, it's something to think about. Anyway, just to, uh, I mean, without giving justice to all the details, it was, Zambia nationalized copper slowly in the 1960s and 70s. It had joint ventures in the 60s. It eventually nationalized the industry. It used to export 600,000 tons a year in the 60s. When it became state-owned enterprise, for reasons that were partially due to internal mismanagement and partially due to external factors like the elimination of access to certain ports because of wars going on and so on. Its production of copper went down from 600,000 to 200,000 and its industry, its copper industry is running losses of 10% of GDP a year. It was losing a million dollars a day in the late 1990s from its main export industry which was copper. It was run so bad. In that context, it was forced to privatize by the IMF because accompanying all that were macroeconomic crises and balance of payments crises. The deal that Zambia got for privatizing its copper sector was probably the worst deal, mining deal in history. From some people's perspective, essentially what happened is foreign mining companies bought up this industry and we're given tax holidays essentially for 20 years. So the billions of dollars, and they've helped revive the industry. It's back to almost 600,000 tons again or more now. And going toward a, a million probably. But all of the companies have paid almost no royalties. So while it's generated billions in export earnings, there's been almost 
there's been very little up until recently tax collection in Zambia. Now, if you compare that, there's been some tax collection, something like you know, 50, 60 million dollars out of, I don't know how many billions, so very little. But if you compare that to the 1990s when it was losing 10% of GDP a year, it's an improvement. At least it's not a drain on the. But if you replicate this story across Sub-Saharan Africa, there's been a huge missed opportunity of appropriating, and even the IMF, right, Zambia has a, had a 0.6% royalty on copper. It's the lowest royalty in the world. And it had a very low equity share of the state. If you replicate that across Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a potential missed opportunity. And some policy implications that follow from that, one is that the IMF is actually advocating for higher royalties because it, the appropriating for minerals and fuels would vastly outnumber the amount of money that comes in from aid if African governments could appropriate a normal rate of return that, say, Venezuela or Australia does for minings and fuels, which is 30 to 40 percent. So there's certainly an urgent need for mineral abundant states to enter into negotiations of mining contracts when they're unfavorable. There's a need to development, develop strategies that link minerals to an industrialization strategy. Right? It's not just about taxing minerals. Development is about industrializing them. And currently, there's very few countries that have coherent strategies of taking copper and making copper wires and then making more sophisticated electronics. That's how the United States developed. It developed industrializing its minerals. That's how Australia developed. That's how Finland and Sweden developed. Minerals don't need to be an enclave, but you need a strategy. So it's about appropriating the revenue from minerals, one, and two, using those revenues to develop a production strategy to add value. And thirdly, building the geological capacity of sub-Saharan African governments. They enter into negotiations with very little information of what they have under the ground. And that gives them a, neg a bad bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis multinationals. If the World Bank and IMF were to invest in one thing that would increase domestic resource mobilization in this region, it would be investing in the geological survey capacity because it would give governments a lot more bargaining power about what they have under the ground. Um, a second issue, and this is more relevant to the issue of thinking about tax and its relationship to governance. And this discussion comes from work that I've done at the Crisis States Research Center at the London School of Economics over the last few years. One of the things we argued in that program was that tax collection or a component of indicators of tax collection can be a quite useful indicator um, of a state that's quite resilient or stable. And it's also a useful indicator of governance because to collect taxation most tax is collected through voluntary compliance. If the government had to go with a barrel of a gun to everyone's house to collect tax, that's probably a sign of a government that's not very legitimate. And the transaction cost of collecting tax that way would be very high. So when you see tax collection increasing, it's picking up or it's proxying for a pa at least a passive acceptance of, of a government's right to rule was what we call the light form of legitimacy. Maybe I mean, people aren't jumping up and down about the government, but there at least there's a passive acceptance when you pay tax, voluntarily. And that, to me, tells you more about governance than any other, of all the other indicators combined. Partially because it's picking up legitimacy quite well, and also partially because it's financing the things that governments need. So if you have, for, an, for example, an index of rule of law, well, it costs a lot of money to protect property rights in the rule of law. So taxation indirectly, so I would argue that the rule of law is a redundant, in some sense, a redundant indicator, because if you don't have any money to have a police force and an army and a judiciary to enforce contracts and protect the rule of law, the rule of law is redundant to the tax collection of a state. And secondly, if people are voluntarily paying, that's telling you a lot about how legitimate a government is. I would argue it's telling you a lot about most of the things that are actually collected. Or at least I would argue one should think about reducing the number of variables, thinking more theoretically and analytically about which ones are more important to an index, to an idea of governance. <coughs> 
Because the other, the, the very detailed ones are very useful because you can see where states are good and bad in certain things. So collecting a lot of information is quite useful. But one, when one steps back analytically, one has to begin to prioritize which are the three or four that are most important that actually, actually all the other ones depend on. If you don't tax, collect tax, all the other ones are not going to follow. Right? It's not the other way around. You're not going to have great rule of law and then you're going to collect tax. It's more difficult to argue that. Of course there are feedback effects. So if you look at components of tax collection like, is there a monopoly over tax collection? That's the single most important one. A country like Somalia or Afghanistan, the state doesn't even have a monopoly over tax collection, and that's telling you that that's a quite fragile or even collapsed state, certainly a failed one. Is there a territorial reach of the state? There's a lot of literature historically that looks at, you know, how many post offices are there in a country? How many tax offices are there across the territory? Right? If a country just has two tax offices in the capital and then you don't see one anywhere else, there's no presence of the state and you're going to not probably have very good governance or engagement between state and citizens that's going to be institutionalized. Direct income tax is quite important because it means that elites and upper income groups are engaged in tax collection. They're the ones with the greatest ability to pay. The higher direct income tax is a proportion of tax. That is personal and corporate and, and property tax is the more likely you're to have a stable relationship between the state and elites. The tax effort index is quite important. That's based on an econometric or a statistical average. At your level of development, what percentage of GDP should you be collecting based on a sample of all the countries in the world at that level or at different levels, and then looking at what you actually are collecting. That's called tax effort. And finally, a qualitative complement to this is how does the state collect tax? Is it done through coercive means or not? And if you take that composite of tax collection, I would argue it's a quite useful way of thinking about how stable a state is and what type of governance it has. And if you look at some data across Sub-Saharan Africa, I, if you take this to 2010, the story is not that different, although some countries like Rwanda have actually increased. So what I want to point out here, there's, there, there's a set of higher tax states and subset. This is as a tax collection as a percentage of GDP or national income. So of course some of the oil or mineral and fuel countries collect quite a lot. Some of them have bad governance and this is the resource curse like Angola or, or had, had actually civil war. Some of them don't have resources that were quite high tax collectors like Malawi, Zambia, historically Zimbabwe, South Africa and so on. And then there's a set this is the annual average from 84 to 2004. And then there were a set of countries that were lower tax collectors on average. Senegal actually should have been in the higher tax collection category. A lot of these countries that collected quite low tax were actually countries that were quite vulnerable to political violence, partially because they didn't have states that could pay militaries, professional militaries. Um, well, we can come back to this, but I just wanted to, you can look at this slide in more detail, but there's a big variation. There's not one story of tax collection in sub-Saharan Africa. And by the way, South Africa has probably a more efficient of the upper middle income countries than any country in East Asia, including South Korea or Taiwan. It's the benchmark country of um, tax collection of amongst the middle income countries in the world, probably. The OECD even consults SARS, the South African Revenue Authority. If you look at the share of direct taxes, that is personal and corporate income taxes, these are the taxes that are collecting from elites. Countries that collect quite a lot from elites, South Africa, Zambia, Rwanda more recently, tend to be more stable than countries that collect less, particularly Uganda, DRC. And one of that, one of that's just, this is just an example. One would need to do a bigger sample. But what it's proxying for, right, is what's the relationship between state and elites? The higher that number is, the more likely the relationship is likely to be stable. And this looks at tax effort. This gives you an idea of, in 2007, how many dollars per capita in tax revenue was collected in countries. That's that number I was talking about. Zambia, in 2007, collected $219 a person in tax, and that's a very comparatively successful tax collector in sub-Saharan Africa because it has a quite diversified tax base, including corporate income tax, uh, personal income tax, sorry, not corporate. 
tax effort is looking at, if you take out minerals and fuels, this is from the, OE, this is from the OECD Africa Economic Outlook, which is produced every year. In 2010, they did a special report on taxation in Africa. What you'll find is, a, with even taking out copper, a country like Zambia collects 30% more tax than it, you would expect given its level of per capita income. Tax effort in Uganda is quite high, Rwanda, Mozambique, and so on. So there's a difference in tax effort across countries. And this is a quite important, I would argue, one component of an indicator of taxation. I'm not arguing that tax is a causal has a causal effect on stability. What I think the most, because there needs to be much more research on that. What I would argue is that tax is an indicator that's reflecting a political economy in a country. And you're absolutely right that you need a certain amount of stability to collect tax. What I'm also arguing is it's not just tax collection. If you look at these composite set of stories, so the monopoly over tax collection. Now, of course, to have a monopoly over tax collection, that, I would argue, has to come first. So if you're in Afghanistan, if the state does not, from a security perspective, control all of the borders of its country, then you're not going to get a monopoly over tax collection. And I would argue that political stability becomes more difficult. So when you look at the monopoly, so I wouldn't argue it's just tax collection. Qualitatively, what's more important, the most basic thing is, does the state have a monopoly over tax revenue collection. If there are warlords competing for tax collection in your country, or drug lords or whatever, then you're not going to get to So I would argue that actually you need to think of tax in terms of linking it with security. First, just a basic Weberian function. Do you have a monopoly over the means of violence? If you don't have that, you're not going to have a monopoly over tax collection. So in that sense, but the other ones, you're absolutely right. It more reflects the political economy of a country than is actually causing it. But I do think that policies that enhance tax collection can make an independent difference in the long run. Because when a government increases its bureaucratic capacity to collect tax, it forces interest groups to form, to resist it, change it, um, advise for a new policy, and so on. And because, because tax often leads, it, it, it helps generate the constitution of interest groups business associations, labor unions, that, want, well, that might complain about the tax regime in a country. That's very important as an incentive to mobilize collectively. And mobilization collectively, political parties, unions, that's important for governance because the transaction costs of bargaining are not individuals. They're collective groups like parties, labor unions, civic associations, business associations, and so on. That's how democracy works. Right? And so tax can actually provide an incentive for collective organization. So I do think it can have an independent, apart from the security one, an independent effect on the construction of civil society, which is so central to an institutionalized, nonviolent conflict resolution mechanism that we call democracy. Um, but you're absolutely right. We're not at the stage where we can say tax preceded effective governance and stability. Taxes, in principle, Tax is the transfer of uh, resources from private sector to the public sector. Yeah. So uh, that's the main responsibility of government is to establish private rights or private property and to protect it using the taxes. So how, how do you see this principle in terms of Africa when we don't have that uh, visible private property? That's one thing. The, uh, the How do I see, what's the question? How do I see? This principle in relation to Africa. Of the state having to first create secure private property rights. Ah, the fact that the resources has to go from private to public so that to protect themselves again. Okay. And that's, that's one thing. The other one is I want to be clear uh, with the uh, relation or difference between rent-seeking corruption. But the difference between rent-seeking and corruption? What you tend to see so, so if you have a low tax base that's collecting, you know, 100, in the best scenario, of three, four hundred dollars a person, what you're like, what you do see in sub-Saharan Africa, so this is the, the mobilization of resources in a poor country. Arthur Lewis in 19, 
54, one of, wrote one of the most famous, from, from St. Lucia, one of the most famous articles in development called Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor. And he won the Nobel Prize in Economics for it. One of two people from St. Lucia who have won it, and they have the highest number of Nobel laureates per capita, because they have about 60,000, I don't know, 100,000 people. Um, his argument was, how does a poor country go from a very low savings rate, which is part of domestic mobilization of resources, of 5% of GDP to 10 to 15? How does that process happen? Because the poverty trap is you have low savings, you can't invest, you can't invest, you can't hire people, you can't hire people, nobody earns any income, there's no market, and you have a vicious circle of poverty. That's the poverty trap. That was developed in the 1940s, that idea. Not by Arthur Lewis, but by Nurkse, an Estonian economist. Um, what you see at low levels of development is a quite low savings rate and a quite low tax base. And, but yet, development means, often means getting the private sector activated to develop industries and hire people and so on and so forth. What you see in low-income countries is, first of all, a very selective protection of property rights. So very well-connected individuals will have, can either afford private security or have a, implicit or explicit contracts with the state that their sectors are very important and their property rights will be protected. So you have a very uneven protection of property rights. Why? Because the state simply doesn't have the tax revenue to protect the property rights of everyone. Just think, they collect $100 a person. How are they going to do that? But what you do see, so how does economic development happen? It happens because there is a selective protection of certain important strategic industries, either state-owned or important private sectors, say coffee plantations, and so on and so forth. Now, where does tax come in? Tax comes in because country, a country like Mauritius, which I can come to if we have time, they're one of the, more, you know, one of the most successful sub-Saharan African developers in the last 50 years. Taxation is important because it's a way of pooling money to build infrastructure. Historically, if you look at the United States, Japan, at very low levels, 250 years ago, agricultural taxes of elites were willingly paid because the state plowed most of the money back into infrastructure, into irrigation, into marketing, into crop development, and so on and so forth, fertilizer. And so if you have, what, what happens is tax is often very used selectively to protect to develop certain strategic industries. And each landowner on its own can't afford the road or the irrigation, but tax is a way of pooling resources from those that are able to, you know, very wealthy producers that can enhance their capital accumulation beyond what they could individually because it solves a collective action problem of providing lumpy public goods. And so, but it's worked historically when tax particularly the tax of agriculture, was linked explicitly as part of a production strategy. It's a second point I'd like you to take away, is that discussions of taxation can't be done in isolation. It's not just to collect more tax. You have to ask, to collect more tax to do what with it? Right? Because you often hear, I'm not going to pay tax because the government's just going to steal it. Right? So how the government spends depends on the willingness of people to pay. So you need to link tax to expenditure policy because the legitimacy of collecting taxes is enhanced if people see that the government are actually spending it on people that are disadvantaged. If elites are just appropriating it, then tax collection becomes more difficult. Also, taxation needs to be linked to production strategies. Why are you taxing? Because if you tax at too high a level, right, the classic neoliberal argument is that that's a disincentive for production because they're taking all my profits. So you need to think of tax not just in pro-revenue terms, but in pro-growth terms, how is your tax policy affecting the development of your country? And so the too much discussion of tax is technical and not linking it to broader issues. But to answer your question about there's a very selective protection of property rights and in successful cases, there's an earmarking, a targeting of tax to plow back into enhancing production through the provision of infrastructure when it works. The second question of rent-seeking corruption Rent-seeking refers to the time and money spent on trying to influence the state to gain a privilege, like a monopoly right, like access to foreign exchange that's scarce or whatever. Corruption is a subset of rent-seeking. It's an illegal form 
right, through bribery, of trying to influence the state to gain an economic or political privilege. Democracy works on rent-seeking, but it takes the form of legal rent-seeking, right? lobby groups. Some people call OECD countries institutionalized bribery because political party contributions are legal, but really it's rich people influencing the government. I don't think that's actually true because I think it's, it's institutionalized and stable and you can vote down the government if you don't like that. But so there's, there's legal types of rent seeking, which are lobbying. That's how democracy works. And then there are informal me mechanisms like clientelism and patronage, which are not necessarily illegal, which dominate. Legal rent seeking tends to be smaller the poorer the country because civil society is less developed because the econ economy is less developed. Right? It takes time and money to organize collectively. And if you're on the border of starvation, it's difficult to join a union. Right? You're just trying to survive. Um, so you have legal rent seeking, you have informal rent seeking, like patron client networks. A leader will give to his region in return for votes, and they might get some privileges that other people don't. You have illegal rent seeking, which is corruption, and that tends to be higher the poorer the country. And then you have, if, if both legal, informal, and illegal don't give you any joy, what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's your last resort? Yeah, you take up arms, violent rent seeking. I'll capture the state to get the rents. So you can think of rent seeking as a broad set of influencing activities. Corruption is one subset of rent seeking. That's the, the, I hope that answers your question. Yes? I didn't actually even put the level, because I don't think the level necessarily tells you anything. If you're an oil-rich country that doesn't have to bargain with citizens, that doesn't mean you're going to have a stable state. What I said is if you look at the monopoly over tax code, you can collect 10% of GDP, low level, but if you have a monopoly, like Tanzania, it has a monopoly over tax collection. It's not a star tax performer, but it doesn't have any rivals to it, like Somalia or Afghanistan does. So even though it doesn't, so I'm actually arguing it's not about the level. It's about, if you look at these five indicators, it tells you a lot about a polity. And actually, tax over GDP is not one of them. I think I'd say the, the single most important one is the basic Viberia one. Do you have a monopoly over tax collection? That tells you basically, or essentially, more about a state than anything else. Even if you don't collect a lot, like Tanzania. Yeah. So Uganda collects similar amounts to Tanzania, but it doesn't have the same monopoly that Tanzania has. Uganda has the Buganda Kingdom that challenges the central state to collect tax. It's got the north where the state doesn't even, where there's a war going on. So they collect the same amount, but if you looked at the monopoly index, Tanzania would be much more stable than Uganda on that. It, they both collect around 11%. Well, Tanzania has actually increased recently to about 15%. It's done a, quite a good job of that. Right, but, but even, say, five years ago, they were about the same as Uganda, but very different qualitatively. So I'm not arguing it's tax over GDP. Angola collects 32% over GDP in tax. It's not a better governed country in governance or more stable than Tanzania, which only collects 12 to 15%. So I'm not arguing that at all. It's not just about, because the tax effort and the direct income tax in Angola, outside of oil, is nothing. It's, it's terrible. There's a long history in political theory Margaret Levy has written the most about this, that when a government collects tax, most of it has to be through what she calls quasi-voluntary compliance. That is, there's a threat of coercion. If you don't pay, there's a penalty. That has to be in the background. But if you had to put everyone in a country in jail because they didn't pay tax, or you had to go with a barrel of the gun to collect tax from every household and corporation, then that's probably a sign of a government that's not legitimate. So if your tax collection, let's compare um, you know, a country that collect, country A collects 20% of GDP at the same level of development, country B collects 10%. And let's say their economic structure of ability to collect tax is the same. They have a similar economic structure. One doesn't have oil and the other one doesn't. Same type of economy. They both say coffee export economies with no oil. They have a similar, similar poverty rate income distribution. One collects 20% of GDP, the other one collects 10. What I'm saying is, and say both have a monopoly over tax. What I'm saying is that the country that's collecting 20% has somehow been able to institutionalize 
and legitimize the, the mobilization of resources from its citizens in a greater way than country B. And, because, and, and it's more legitimate in the sense that most tax collection pays because people voluntarily fill out a form and send it to the tax revenue. So that's voluntary compliance. So if you're complying more willingly in a country where country A and B, the ability to pay tax is similar because we're arguing their structure and income per capita are the same. So it's picking up more people voluntarily giving money to the government. And I would argue that that's probably the single best indicator of a legitimate government than anything else. Not the only one, but it's certainly, it's, it's lost in all the other ones. And I would say the history of political theory would argue it's the single most important indicator of government legitimacy. Not necessarily governance, but this is one year. If you can collect 20% year after, because people aren't stupid. If you collect 20% and then the government steals it, and spends no money on roads, no money on schools, no money on education, it's unlikely that in subsequent years it's going to continue to collect 20%. So a better way to look at it is not in one particular year, but say look at a time period of 10 years, what is the average annual tax collection in the country? Because it's a repeated game. People, you have to look at expenditure. What did the government do with the money? If the government is doing things that people are more or less happy with, they'll continue to pay voluntarily. So if country B had a 10% income on average, let's say they grew at the same rate, they have the same economic structure, they're the same in all other ways, but one country, just for the sake of argument, one country's collecting double the amount of its national income. A year after, you say, over a 10-year period, it must mean you would have to come up with a quite convoluted and complicated argument to argue that the country that continues to collect 20% is more illegitimate than the country that continues to collect that. Now, I'll make one proviso to that, and a very important one. If you look at OECD countries, there's a huge variation. So the Nordic countries collect 50% of GDP in tax. Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Germany, F Netherlands. Because they have a history of quite egalitarian income distribution. It's an important part of their political discourse. Social democratic parties have been quite dominant. They have huge welfare states. Because, you know, if you take these countries before taxation, before their fiscal system, Sweden is as unequal as South Africa. Its fiscal system makes it egalitarian. What the government taxes and spends. Right? Before tax and spending, you know, the Wallenberg family in Sweden controls 50% of the Swedish stock exchange today. It's as unequal as South Africa or Brazil before tax and transfer. After tax and transfer, it's one of the most egalitarian countries in the world. But not, on the, not in the capitalist production process, it's not. There's five families that control all of Sweden. Or 90% of industrial production in Sweden is controlled by five families today. The Agnelli family in Italy today controls about 20% of Italian industrial production. One family. Not just fiat, they have a whole set of, right? So my point about, so, so take the Nordic countries, very high tax. Take the United States and Japan. They collect about 35% of GDP because they have a history, a different political discourse. The United States Revolution began with a distrust of the central state, how to create checks and balances on it. That's not as true of Germany or Japan. Sorry, it's not as true of Germany or the Nordic countries. So at high levels, a higher level of tax collection is not necessarily indicating. It's indicating a different... Um, political discourse around whether the private versus the public sector can provide public goods or, or, or collective goods. At lower levels of development, it is possible to argue. The example I gave you was that the countries were identical for the sake of argument. It's possible to argue. You know, when I talk to revenue authorities, ministers in Zambia or Mozambique, they'll tell me, we have an explicit policy of not taxing. The top 15 corporations in Mozambique pay zero corporate income tax the last five years. Why? Because they're on tax holidays to attract FDI. They pay zero. So most of the personal income, the direct income tax, is borne by workers. The owners of foreign direct enterprises have paid zero corporate income tax in Mozambique in the last seven or eight years. But they will tell me, and that's true of Zambia too, not quite as bad as Mozambique, but they'll say that's our production strategy is to attract FDI. So that might be, there might be a legitimate economic policy reason why your tax collection is below potential. 
The example I gave you was that the countries were otherwise similar. And so, just for the sake of argument, a country that has a monopoly over tax and collects more is likely to be more legitimate. But there could be economic policy reasons why the tax collection effort is different across countries. Yeah. Well, that's actually true, but that doesn't mean people couldn't revolt or resist against that policy. Because you're accepting it, at some level, the labor union in the country is accepting the right of the government to do a payee system. So even though it's collected every month out of your wage, at some prior level, there was a bargain that said, this is a legitimate thing to do. So the labor unions in Zambia might not like it. They'd like to pay a little bit less, but they don't, act, they don't take up arms to resist it. In that sense, it's quasi-voluntary. Even though it's taken out each month, that doesn't mean yeah, that it's not reversible. Nothing is forever. Right? And so in that sense, it's a quasi-voluntary compliance. Because you could form a political party to say, we want to reduce it or eliminate it or change the policy. And that hasn't really happened. So you have to assume that there's at least a passive acceptance of the preemptive tax regime. Right? And, and by the way, workers pay most of direct tax in Zambia. Yeah. Now, I want to hear from your own analysis which one would be the best. Because currently in Zambia, yes. we have a debate that the variable tax is the most effective one yeah. and investor friendly. And like they went for taxes, so I just want. It's quite complicated. A lot of that depends on what your projection of the prices of oil are going to uh, copper is going to be. So which whether, yeah, I mean, which one of those type of taxes matters? Yeah, on the state of the economy, but uh, on the on the copper industry. What what I will say more generally is that the difference between Zambia and Chile is simply the equity share of the state. Chile still has a 50 percent equity share in copper production. Its royalty is not that much higher than Zambia's. So it appropriates more, and so that's one issue. And so I would argue that both strategically and in, in terms of controlling the development of the country's industry, increasing the equity share would be more important, and also from a revenue, government revenue share. I think it's less complicated. And also, quite importantly, one of the big problems in the mining sector is a very weak auditing capacity of tax revenue authorities to, to audit multinational companies in terms of their tax avoidance strategies like transfer pricing and so on and so forth. When the government has a larger equity share, it's more involved in the industry and its auditing capacity enhances. Right? The Chilean's capacity to audit the private companies in the sector is much greater because they have much more knowledge about how one might trick the revenue authority. So I would argue both from a strategic point of view of production and in terms of revenue collection, and in terms of some spillover effects of auditing capacity of the revenue authority, I would argue that an increase in an equity share would be a, gradually would be a better way to go. And that will be possible if copper prices stay pretty buoyant. Right? It'll give the government a greater bargaining share. But, but even in terms of royalties, the IMF has become an advocate of increasing royalties because they even kind of realized there was a certain mea culpa in, in how bad of a deal that they bargained for a lot of countries in sub-Saharan Africa. We're um, beyond time, so you tell me. Yes, we are. I think it's time for a short break. I think it's time for a short break. And any questions you have, I'll be around. These, most of the rest of these slides are quite self-explanatory. So if you have any questions about further ones, just ask me. Or you certainly can email me afterward. But we'll talk again uh, on Friday, because I'll give it a call. Thank you.